This study is a continuation of earlier research that documents the association between genotype and educational attainment. Our study was done in a nationally representative sample of Americans that are approaching midlife. They, we started following them when they were in secondary school and they're now in their mid-30s. And what we were able to show is that the polygenic score that we constructed on the basis of prior research predicts about an additional third of a year of educational attainment for those that have a one standard deviation increase in this polygenic score. What is novel about our research, first we were able to show an association between the polygenic score and the neighborhood that a person lives in. So that means that there's some kind of stratification in the polygenic score across the environments that children live in and are raised in. Another novel aspect of our study is the fact that we were able to show a, an association between educational attainment and the polygenic score in the, the African Americans within our sample. Most of the earlier work in this vein has been done with European Americans and so it's very, uh, it's a positive sign that this score also works in the African American sample. We also looked at how the polygenic score worked within families and we were able to show that for a sibling with a higher score that sibling tended to accrue more educational years than their lower scored sibling. And this is important because within families, most of the, the confounders, most of the alternative explanations that we might jump to are no longer possible. Children are raised typically with, you know, com where they have the same parents. They typically have similar home environments, attend similar schools, and so we really feel that the information derived from siblings is probably causal in nature. So I think there are two reasons for the education community to, to be interested in this type of research. The first is that from a research perspective, the, the introduction of genetics into our toolbox for understanding education is just that. It's another tool, another leverage point that we can use to understand the education system that we have. It's known, for example, that there have been some changes in the association between certain behaviors and genetics over time. So smoking is a good example. There's some evidence to suggest that the association between genetics and smoking has gotten stronger over time and this makes sense if we think about the fact that in the mid 50s for example uh, everybody smoked more or less so it's not very informative to know if a person smoked or didn't whereas now if somebody smokes that's likely a, a, a consequence of several things about that person maybe they respond to nicotine differently and so when we chart these associations between genetics and, and some outcome over time we can start to make sense of, of the policy landscape we exist in. So it might be the case with respect to smoking, for example, that the techniques that were used to get people to quit smoking in the 70s and 80s and 90s may no longer work because the smokers that remain in the smoking pool have a different genetic association with smoking, right? They might have a different kind of biology that makes them less susceptible to the, the intervention pathways that we used before. So coming back to education, it could be the case that the the understanding of, of how genetics are associated with educational attainment might offer additional lenses from which to study certain policies. We can ask questions about whether certain students are uh, more or less likely to respond to an intervention given their genetic profile. And so I just think this is an important new uh, facet from which to view the entire uh, complex educational system that as education researchers we analyze. On the policy perspective, we think that this study has uh, several implications. So it, it's important to note that at present the score that we're considering is not one that, that has policy relevance. It doesn't predict strongly enough to be used in any kind of um, clinical way. So we would not want, for example, a child to experience an intervention solely based on their genotype. That would be a, a not very wise thing to do. But it could be that in the near future we see parents, for example, demanding uh, interventions for children based on their genetic profiles. It, uh, there are a number of studies that looked at, say, uh, outcomes like ADHD, right? So we understand the genetics of ADHD fairly well, and it could be in a number of years that a, a parent could have their child genotyped and could bring information to the school district saying, I feel like my kid is genetically at risk for ADHD, even though they're, no, they're not symptomatic at this point, I want an early intervention program to be rolled out for my child. So how would a district manage that, right? What would be the right way to approach that parent and that parent's concerns? And to, to really get to a point where we can handle those concerns effectively, I think we need to understand how gen genetics work. We need to understand how uh, the genetics express themselves. We need to understand how these polygenic influences matter in the real world. And our study is just the first uh, in a line of studies that we hope to do to really kind of better understand these issues. 
And so I think for this reason, the, the genetics of educational attainment will become important in the broader educational climate. The one thing that I was surprised about in the course of doing this study was the finding with respect to siblings. So we knew from earlier work that, uh, that the risk score is strong enough, that the polygenic score is strong enough to predict educational attainment among siblings. What we noticed in this study is the following. We noticed that essentially the reason that you, you use sibling models is to control for confounders, to control for things like socioeconomic status, to control for the uh, school a child goes to, right? You, you use with, within family design to try to eliminate differences between people that could also explain the differences in educational attainment that we're interested in. We started with unrelateds. With unrelateds, we documented a certain, uh, a certain amount of additional education that we expected based on the, uh, the polygenic score. We then started to include controls for maternal education and neighborhood environment, things that we expect to have implications for how many years of education a child completes. We noticed the decline from the unrelated analysis with no controls to the, to the analysis on unrelated when we included those controls, and this decline we would expect. Once you account for maternal education, for example, the, the association with genetics is reduced. That's a, a very sensible thing. We then turned to the, the analysis based on the within family design. Within families, what we noticed is that the estimated effect of the polygenic score was back at the level that we had originally documented amongst the unrelateds when we did not introduce controls. And this suggests something quite interesting is going on. In particular, it suggests that the mechanisms through which the genetic influence is operating could differ slightly between and within families. So it could be, for example, that within families, a small genetic difference between siblings could really lead the siblings to um, basically um, take separate paths. You know, a sibling that realizes that relative to their, their, their brother or sister, they're better at school in some sense, and they really may capitalize on that identity and, and join additional clubs, right? They may, become, may form an identity as a reader. And these small genetic differences within families may be magnified compared to what we would see across families. And so this is something that has uh, very kind of subtle um, implications for a number of studies that have been done previously that have focused on families.